Welcome, everyone. Uh, my name is Victor Mercadante. I'm an associate professor here at Virginia Tech. I'm also the chair of the Beef Revolution Task Force. It is a great pleasure to kick off 2024, our spring webinar series uh, today with you. So I appreciate everybody joining um, from everywhere in the country. And I know we also get some people from outside the country. So we appreciate your support. Um, I want to start by uh, taking our two uh, Diamond Level sponsors, AstroTech um, and Breeding Indicators and uh, Merck Animal Health. Uh, without their support, we cannot provide this kind of programming for free for you guys. So really appreciate their support. Um, I also want to, you know, hopefully we're seeing right in front of you there. I want to make an announcement. Uh, we already have the dates and the location uh, secure for the Applied Reproductive Strategies in Beef Cattle which is our annual uh, in-person meeting. Uh, it's gonna be in September four and five uh, in Athens, Georgia. So we appreciate Dr. Pedro Fontes uh, to be working with us, who's a member of the Beef, Te Beef Reproduction Task Force to be working with us uh, to get this meeting uh, there in, in Georgia. So we'll be posting more details soon, an agenda, a schedule of speakers, uh, but uh, we already have the location and the date. So we wanna make sure everybody uh, is aware of that, and hopefully we can join us um, in, in September there in Athens for this meeting. Um, I also want to remind everybody that we record all these uh, webinars. They're recorded and they're posted in our YouTube channel. So if you check um, Beef Reproduction Task Force on YouTube, uh, you can have access to all um, the webinars since we started this session, which I think was 2020, 2021. Uh, we also have several of the uh, applied reproductive uh, strategies uh, in beef cattle um, seminars that have been recorded out there. So it's a great collection of, of um, talks on beef cattle management and reproductive management. So please take advantage of that. Uh, we're also on social media, so please make sure to follow us on Facebook, uh, X, and Instagram as well. And, and check out our beefreaper.org website, okay? Um, so just a reminder, uh, these webinars are gonna be happening every third Tuesday of the month, uh, 7 p.m. Central Time. So make sure to join us next month for our next webinar, okay? Um, but today I'm gonna be presenting to you guys on how many cleanup bulls do I need after time they die, which is a, a question that we get quite often um, when we're talking about uh, estrus synchronization and using fixed time AI uh, as those animals return to estrus, those cows that do not become pregnant, uh, there's always a concern and a question um, about this. So we thought that might be a, a good way to start this uh, webinar series. So if you have any questions, sorry, if you have that, uh, said that earlier, uh, please use the Q&A tab on Zoom to type your questions. Uh, you can type them at any point. We're going to stop at the end and answer as many questions as we can. Uh, but, you know, you, you don't need to wait until the end to type them up there. Okay. So uh, we're going to talk about, about breeding and, and bulls, um, which really brings us back to uh, reproduction, right? And uh, we're the Beef Reproduction Task Force. And uh, if you're in a cow-calf producer, you're probably really focused on reproduction and reproduction efficiency. So... Uh, there are several ways that we can define reproductive efficiency, but one way that are really uh, that I like to define um, is that we want to optimize pregnancy rate as early as possible in the breeding season, and uh, that's quite important uh, that we do get those cows pregnant as early as possible. And then we also want to develop and select replacement heifers that have high fertility, and we want to do all those things at the lowest cost possible. Right? I mean, I think if you achieve all those things. Uh, then we are reaching reproductive efficiency. But your definition might be different. Um, and if it is different, that's okay. I just challenge you to actually write it down, right? Write it down uh, so that you can follow that and you can um, you really, you know, just not only put yourself to the test, but put your cows to the test, put your operation to the test so they can achieve whatever it is that you uh, define as reproductive efficiency on your operation. So I like to think, um, as reproductive efficiency at this little equation, right? There's not one thing that uh, fix that can really uh, make us achieve reproductive efficiency in a beef cow calf operation. I think it as this little equation is a sum 
of several things that uh, once done, and I believe on that order, uh, can help us achieve our boot efficiency. So those are, you know, management, really having a, uh, a good understanding of your cattle and your operation and, uh, and not just, you know, having animal ID and collecting data, but really using the data that you collect to make decisions, to make uh, management decisions. And I think that's really important. That's the first step, right? You have a breeding season. When is your breeding season? You know, why do you pick that time? Uh, think about when you're going to sell your calves, when you're going to wean your calves, and so on. Uh, really have things, uh, you know, written down in paper, but then look at that paper, look at that data, and make changes as needed, right? And I think that's really what management is. And that's our first step. And then we do need a very uh, solid nutrition and animal health plan uh, in place before we even talk about reproduction, right? You need to make sure that those cows are in good condition, uh, that they have enough nutrients so that they can perform, and also that those animals are healthy. Because uh, we know if they're not healthy, if they're not in good condition, they're just not going to be able to reproduce. Um, and then I believe we really need to uh, have a strong selection pressure for fertility in any cow-calf operation. And we can do that by having a defined breeding season, but have a short defined breeding season uh, to really have a selection criteria for our heifers uh, to meet high fertility standards in our herd. And also we need to prep check animals. I mean, to define, uh, define which animals are pregnant and when they became pregnant. And the animals that are not pregnant are open cows. And the animals that are pregnant will perhaps fall off, uh, fall off the, the desired period that when we want those animals to be pregnant. We can call those animals, right? But definitely we need to call our open animals. And because if we're not really uh, calling our open animals, there's no pressure, uh, no selection pressure for fertility. And then um, after we've done management, we have a solid nutrition animal health program. Uh, we have selection pressure for fertility. Then uh, we can take advantage of reproductive technologies that are out there. And there are several reproductive technologies available. Uh, we talked about pregnancy diagnosis, for example. Uh, even establishing a breeding season perhaps can be considered as a reproductive technology. Um, but two of the most popular uh, reproductive technologies that we really focus on, especially here in the Beef Reproduction Task Force, are artificial insemination, right? And there are several uh, advantages of using artificial insemination. Perhaps the two most uh, powerful ones are really the widespread selection of bulls of proven genetics, right? The ability to buy some of the top genetics on any uh, given uh, breed for a fraction of the price, right? Of those of those high um, merit bulls, and also the ability to do crossbreeding, right? That um, can be done really easily through artificial insemination. Okay, um, but one step over. Um, artificial insemination is really the use of astrosynchronization and um, fixed time the AI, right? So astrosynchronization is really the pharmacological control of the astrocycle. So before that, we were we need to depend or we were depending on uh, estrus detection or heat detection to be able to artificially inseminate those cows, uh, which can be done and, and it can um, uh, you know achieve good success. But especially on larger operations or in operations where we're really pushing animals to become pregnant in a short period of time, uh, using, using estrus synchronization can really help us achieve those goals, right? Without the need of estrus detection or heat detection, for example, which really optimizes labor. Mm -hmm. uh, but estrus synchronization, again, allows us to do fixed time artificial insemination, right? And for, for females that are in uh, an estrus postpartum, for example, or heifers that have not reached uh, puberty, those protocols have been shown to be very effective of inducing cyclicity, uh, which is can be a very powerful tool um, on, on your operation. And um, also, it increases the proportion of females are exposed to AI because you're most likely will be AIing every female that you synchronize and can help us get more females pregnant to AI uh, in a very short period of time, which is really uh, beneficial. 
So if you heard of the Beef Reproduction Task Force and if you attended some of our webinars and you've been to the ARSBC meetings, uh, you probably um, have seen our website and perhaps the thing that we're most known for is our protocols, right? So if you go to our website, beefrepro.org and you click on the protocols link, uh, you're gonna see some of the um, protocol sheets that we have developed. And most, if not all um, of the major AI companies also will print out some of these uh, protocol sheets into their catalog, uh, semen catalogs. So we have uh, four uh, sheets now that are available. Our first sheet is uh, a mix of heat detection protocols and protocols for natural service, right? Synchronization protocols for natural service, which if you're not doing extra synchronization, uh, those are great place to start with your operation, right? Uh, uh, and, and get your cattle get 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 your cattle used to the the process. Get yourself used to the process uh, before you you perhaps jump into some of the more uh, advanced uh, protocols that we have. Uh, for example, our sheet for the pro, uh, beef cow protocols. There are uh, use heat detection and time AI, and also fixed time fixed time AI uh, protocols that we have. Uh, same thing for the heifers, um, right? We have those two categories. And we try to limit the no more than five protocols within category, right? And, and uh, we get questions quite often about, you know, why are those protocols there versus others? Uh, you know, the whole purpose of the beef reproduction task force, once it was actually created um, way back, it was to actually do that, right? Help producers um, pick protocols um, without the, the doubt uh, of whether those protocols will be successful, right? So for a protocol to be included on the Beef Reproof Task Force sheets, it has to have, um, you know, thousands of inseminations be repeated um, in different geographic locations. Uh, you know, it has to be sound science uh, testing those protocols to be able to, to show that those protocols are effective in both estrus uh, and in both cycling and non-cycling females. Uh, in a variety of types of cattle and, and so forth. So within each category of those sheets, those protocols will um, work really, uh, really well. And also will have results that are very comparable within protocols, because that's usually another question that we get. You know, within those four protocols, which one do I, do I use, right? Uh, which one is the best? And uh, those protocols have very uh, comparable type of results. Uh, when when used properly, so it really depends on you know if you want a long uh, type of protocol, you want a short period uh, time protocol, uh, and, and so on. So uh, it depends on your operation and you know facilities that you have that you can make those decisions. But if the protocols are here, you can trust that they will work um, uh, and will deliver good results. Um, another pr protocol sheet that we have, a more recent one is a sex semen protocol, um, you know, grow in the, in the industry for sure an interest on using sex semen, uh, not only in the dairy industry, but on the beef industry more recently. So uh, we have a couple of different protocols uh, for heifers and for cows and also a couple of different types of um, uh, programs, right? We've just fixed on the AI or we call split time the AI where you can do a mix of using um, uh, sex semen for animals that show estrus and then conventional semen for those animals that don't show estrus to really uh, use the technology, uh, the better way of using technology perhaps, because we know that we can have better success so using sex semen when those females are in heat and the cost of sex semen tends to be a little bit higher. So if we can plan those things, we usually have a better success and, and help you uh, with your economics um, in, in the operation. So I highly recommend, uh, if you're not aware of those protocols, please visit the website uh, and you can download those for free. And, and if you have been using Astro Synchronization, hopefully using one of these protocols. Uh, but if you haven't used, again, we recommend that you um, source your protocols out of one of those, those sheets. Right, but um, really, you know, we talk about time the AI uh, and we understand uh, the genetic effect or the genetic improvement that we can get from using artificial insemination, but we believe that the benefits of fixed time AI 
go beyond just the, the, the use of AI and the ability to get better genetics and improve genetics pretty quickly of using AI, right? So especially, uh, we can really increase the, uh, the, um, the number of females that get pregnant early in the breeding season, okay? And that's a very powerful uh, thing that we can do and we can do pretty quickly uh, with fixed time AI. So I want to share a study, perhaps one of the uh, nicest studies that have been done there to show really this effect of uh, synchronization that can have on getting females pregnant early and then calving early. So this study by Dr. Lamb and um, his, his group, and almost uh, 10 years old now, uh, where they looked at two uh, groups of cattle, a uh, control, control group of cattle that uh, were exposed to a 90-day breeding season. Uh, without synchronization, so just natural service. And then a group of cattle that were uh, estrosynchronized, AI'd, uh, and then exposed to uh, night day breeding season with natural service, right? So the biggest difference between those two groups were the use of synchronization and exposed to AI on the beginning of the breeding season, uh, followed them by natural service or those um, for 90 days with those cleanup bulls, right? The other thing that they did on this study to try and um, uh, balance out the genetic if, uh, or rule out the genetic effect uh, on, on those offspring is they use uh, natural service bulls with very similar APDs to the natural to the AI sires that they were used here to try and balance out some of those genetic improvements. Uh, that they can come from from time to AI from using artificial insemination. Okay. Um, if we look at our control versus time to AI, time to AI group of cattle have an increased winning rate. So uh, more cows actually win calves out of the time to AI group versus our control. Uh, but one of the most impressive results that we've seen on this study was an increase in winning weight of of calf exposed uh, per cow, of calf per cow exposed, right? So this is in kilograms here, uh, but it was about a 17 kilogram difference or 38 pound difference uh, in average of uh, pounds of calf weaned per cow exposed between the time the AI group and then the control group, right? So it's a lot of pounds when you're selling pounds of calf, uh, that's, that's definitely significant, right? Um, and you might be asking, you know, where are those pounds, extra pounds of calf are coming from, right? If we rule out the genetic effect, or we try to balance uh, that on that study by using uh, sires with similar EPDs, both from the natural service and the artificial insemination, you know, where are those pounds of calf coming? And it really comes from where those calves are born, right? So we have more calves being born early in the calving season, within the first 20 days of the calving season, on the time the AI group versus our control group, okay? And if you think about those, those uh, young calves, uh, those pre wean calves, they're usually gaining about two pounds a day, right? If, if you have more calves being born early, they'll be heavier uh, at weaning because they're older, right? They have more time to grow, they'll be heavier at, at weaning. So you have more pounds of calf uh, to wean uh, per cow exposed. So that's where that difference comes from. It's from you having more cows pregnant early, right? That's the effect of synchronization and AIing all your cows uh, in the beginning of the breeding season, or the first day of the breeding season, uh, which will then cause those cows to calve early. And then those calves that are born early, they grow better. Uh, they grow more, right? And then they will be heavier at weaning, okay? Um, one very nice thing that they did on this study, uh, they did a uh, partial budget analysis, right? To look at, it's like, okay, we have more pounds of calf, but they also have more, uh, an increased cost associated with synchronization, right? And buying semen, for example, uh, so that we can do uh, our um, astro synchronization. So they did several, um, here are some, uh, this is partial economic analysis, and this is the model assumptions, right? This is 2007 uh, numbers that's in the publication, okay? So average bull price is $3,200. Uh, savage 
uh, price for the bull, right? It's just selling those bulls back. Um, you know, the cost of maintaining that bull, uh, interest rate 7%, price of calf, uh, 500 pound calf, uh, price of semen, about $13, uh, which is probably low compared to today, but, um, but that's okay. And then um, also a reduction in bull to cow ratio, okay, which is, we'll, we'll talk about that later. So going from um, one bull to 17 cows to uh, one bull to 34 cows. Right, so having more uh, more cows for the one bull to breed in the cleanup bulls, right after time they die. Okay, so they calculated the increased returns versus the de de decreased costs and increased costs, and um, and showed a gain of forty nine dollars. Okay, on uh, whenever uh, we're using fixed time they die compared to just natural service. Okay. So even though there was an increased cost associated with synchronization and artificial insemination, uh, the, the increased returns that came from um, having more pounds of cap to sell and the decreased costs of having to buy less bulls um, overpowered the increased costs that came with the synchronization and AI, right? So about a $49 gain uh, on those on those scenarios. So uh, using that economic model, uh, Dr. Lamb and while uh, Ashley was on his uh, graduate team at that time, uh, we, we came up with the AI calculator, uh, which used to be an app, but it's not available anymore, but you can still download on the Beef Reproduction Task Force website under resources. You can download a spreadsheet, an Excel spreadsheet that does the same calculation, right? Uh, and it uses that economic model uh, to help you estimate whether or not you uh, using astrosynchronization fixed time DI would be economic, economically feasible uh, on your operation. So you can input uh, your you know, all your data related to your own cow herd. So how many cows you have, how many service, uh, how many bulls usually you have, right? Which your uh, average wean calf crop and so on. Uh, your expected prices for those calves, how much you pay for your bull, how much it costs to maintain your bull, and so on. Uh, increased costs are associated with uh, use of fixed time AI, right? So additional labor if you need more help, or if you need to hire somebody to actually AI the cattle, uh, price of semen, and so on. And you can input all of those information, okay? And if you don't know uh, a number, one of those values, if you click on the red arrow, it will give you a national average, which is, uh, and then you can use that as a, you know, as a um, uh, approximation of the costs on your operation, and it should give you a pretty good, um, a pretty good number to use uh, if you don't know those those costs. Okay, then if you hit calculate at the end, it will give you a number uh, that's going to be either positive or negative. Uh, is it going to be a gain or loss per cow exposed? Uh, on the scenario of using uh, extra synchronization fixed time, the IRS is just natural service. And it also gives you a total uh, gain or loss uh, for the herd. So it's a pretty nice tool uh, to help you budget and understand, uh, does it make sense to use this in my operation, right? So I uh, hope you um, you take advantage of that and, and can download it on Excel and, and play with the numbers a little bit. It's always uh, interesting to see, okay? So going back to that study, Though, even though overall there was a $49 advantage of using fixed time AI versus just natural service, you can see that within the eight locations that were enrolled in that study, uh, there was quite a lot of variation, right, in, in, the, in the economic benefit of using fixed time AI. Some operations um, gaining as high as $139 per cow exposed, and one operation losing $6 per cow exposed, right? But in average, um, $49 difference, right? But there's a big spread here, uh, there uh, between making more money or losing money uh, or not making as much money when using fixed time AI, right? So what, what drives that variation, okay? So if you remember some of the model assumptions, right? One of the things um, is this reduction um, in the number of bulls, right? The ability to buy less bulls to cover your cows, okay? So where is that coming from, right? Well, if we're doing AI, 
um, we're hoping that approximately 50% of our cows will become pregnant by AI, right? And we have a lot of data that can back that up. So in average, we're going to get, uh, when using fixed time AI, we're going to get about 50% of our cows pregnant. We've seen higher numbers than that. We've seen lower numbers than that. But in average, uh, over the years, you're probably looking very close to 50%, right? So if I um, get 50% of my cows pregnant by AI, then I can reduce in half the number of cleanup bulls that I need to breed my remaining cows, right? My open cows. So uh, in a very simple example here, if I'm using a one, to, one bull to 25 cow, which is a very uh, common bull to cow ratio, and I have 100 cows, if I'm doing all natural service, I'm going to need to buy four bulls, right? If I have those same 100 cows and I'm using estro synchronization and I get 50% pregnancy rate, I have 50 remaining open cows from the AI. And if I'm going to use the same 1 to 25 uh, bull to cow ratio, I only need to buy two bulls now. Okay. So um, that assumption is what really drives uh, a big portion of those uh, of that economic model to favor the astro synchronization uh, and fixed time AI uh, scenarios, right? So for example, if you're buying a bull that costs $2,500, right? Your gain per cow exposed when using AI, about $41, okay? But if you buy a more expensive bull, let's say $4,500, uh, then your gain per cow exposed to AI goes up because you're not spending as much, you're not, you know, by having to buy less bulls, you're not spending as much money, right? So there's an argument right here too that um, that, that $4,500 bulls are getting hard to find, right? Um, and, uh, you know, we, we have a couple of sales here in Virginia and um, our Virginia Tech sale, I think we average higher than that, right? Uh, so for our bulls. So uh, if you're paying more money, if you're buying more expensive bulls or cleanup bulls, then you're more likely to make more money uh, when using astro synchronization, right? So, uh, you know, that's another question that I get, right? So how much is a good bull, right? How much is that? And then uh, I found this quote from uh, Dr. Mark Johnson um, on uh, Oklahoma. And he said, a good bull is worth the value of five calves he sires, right? I think that's been a, a long, uh, something, a saying that's been probably before him, but um, but I really like that, right? So, you know, if, let's think about this. If you're if you're selling, for example, 500 pound steers at $2 a pound, which is probably close to a national average. Um, so you're selling a steer for about $1,000, right? Um, a good bull then will be $5,000, right? Um, and, but, the, the reality is that, that that really depends, right? It depends on, on how you're going to market those calves and, you know, the market conditions. So that value can really change every year as the market changes, right? Um, so, you know, a good bull, depending on what you're thinking and how you sell your calves, right? Because, for example, if you're retaining ownership of some of those calves, then you really should look at the price that you get at the end, right? So some, as, as you do those things, uh, you can increase what that good bull value is for your operation, right? So, you know, big range there. But but for sure, if you're buying bulls uh, that have great genetic merit uh, and are on the top of their breed and come, uh, you know, have passed a BSC and come from uh, reputable producers and, and breeders, uh, you're most likely looking at that five thousand dollar nowadays, right? That uh, price tag ticket for um, price tag for a bull. Okay. So you know we talk about that one to twenty five bull to cow ratio, and and really uh, as you look in the most recent uh, uh, literature, that's that's what the recommendation is, right? A one to twenty to one to thirty, one to twenty five in average. So one bull to twenty five cows. It's really what um, most, most people use, okay? There's also what we call the Auburn formula uh, that uses the bull age, Dr. Wenzel kind of, um, and really peers had that and have looked at this a different way of, of looking at uh, bull to cow ratio, right? And trying to really, 
put some some numbers behind this, right? So how can we really uh, make sure that we're using the, the adequate boot power that we need and we're not underutilizing our boot power or overutilizing our boot power? There's an interesting way of looking at this. So, um, you know, you look about if the bulls is younger than 36 months, so uh, younger than 36 months of age, the number of cows that he can breed should be proportional to the aging months of that bull. So if you have an 18-month-old bull, he should be breeding 18 cows, right? Um, that's the idea. If you have a 24-month-old bull, he should be breeding 24 cows up until 36 months. And then after that, one thing that can be used is um, it, the number of cows that he can breed can be proportional to the scrotum circumference in centimeter, okay? So if you have a bull uh, that has a 40 centimeter scrotal circumference, he could be breeding 40 cows, for example, right? Um, and we know that scrotal circumference um, is directly related to uh, semen production, uh, not, certain, not necessarily semen quality, but semen production, right? So, um, you know, a couple of different ways of looking at this. But if you look at USDA data and the national average, what people really are doing in the U.S. for young bulls, according to the last survey that we got in the cow calf study, um, the most the average bull to cow ratio is one bull to fifteen cows, right? Probably heifers here in this case, and for mature bulls, uh, is one bull to twenty two cows. Okay, so really. Uh, the average below their recommendation of 1 to 25, and definitely below uh, their recommendation if you look at the Auburn formula, right? So for the most part, um, our bulls are underutilized, uh, or not underutilized, but are under capacity, uh, breeding capacity, um, as, it's, as it seems, right? So, but really important, as you think about this and you think about bull to cow ratio and how many bulls do I need to buy and, and you know buy a good bull and so on, is that we use bulls that have successfully passed a breeding soundness exam, right? A BSC, uh, which is an exam, right? That has three parts. We talk quite often we talk about the semen test, right? That's how most people will refer to a BSC, but it really it's beyond that, right? It's more comprehensive than just a semen test, right? It has a general physical examination, right? I want to make sure that, that bull um, has good feet and legs, right? So he can walk around and he can jump cows, that he can see, he's not blind, that he's in good overall health so that he can get the job done, right? Uh, we also take an examination of the reproductive system. we we'll look at the penis, we we'll look at the accessory glands, we we'll look at the testicles, uh, the scrotum, we we'll make sure everything looks good. Um, and then we'll, um, we'll collect a semen sample of those bulls and we'll look at semen quality, right? We'll look at concentration, we'll look at morphology, make sure that, um, we'll look at motility, make sure those cells are moving and there's enough um, cells there to, to get cows pregnant, right? Um, but it's also important to, to, to know that a BSC does not test for libido, for mating ability, for venereal diseases, and for long-term fertility, right? We cannot test after a BSC that that bull has good health, has his, um, his, the reproductive organs in order, and is producing uh, viable semen, right? But we cannot, with a BSC, uh, a test if that bull is actually going to breed cows, right? Uh, is not part of the BSC. Uh, things like trick, for example, testing for trick, uh, which is very common in a lot of states um, in the Midwest, for example, right? That's usually not included unless stated uh, on the BSC. And really important, when you buy a bull, if you're buying a bull, for example, from a sale, from a bull test, which several states have now um, in, in partnership with Extension, University Extension, so on, uh, I'll guarantee those bulls have passed the BSC, right? And But that does not mean that we don't need to test those bulls anymore, right? So the recommendation is that we retest that, those bulls every year, right? 
60 to 90 days before the breeding season, ideally, so that if they fail, we can retest or we can have enough time to buy another bull, right? Um, but again, really important to test it every year because the BSC, it's not a long-term fertility test, okay? And things can change um, every year, all right? So here's um, some data out of the USDA, uh, some of that same survey uh, that I mentioned earlier of the percentage of operations here divided in, in, in size, so small, uh, medium, and large operations uh, that perform a BSC on their bulls every year, right? So um, in our small producers up to 49 cows, um, there are only about a quarter of them that will do a BSC every year, right? Whether our larger producers, and for the USDA, if you have more than 200 cows, you consider a large cow-calf operation, uh, about two-thirds of them will perform a BSC on their bulls every year, right? But overall, only about 30% of our operations actually testing those bulls every year, right? What's really scary about um, the, the, the small producer, up to 50 cows there, is that a lot of times um, they might have only one bull, right? Uh, and, or, you know, have two bulls, and if one bull uh, doesn't pass that BSC or is not able to breed and we didn't do a BSC and we don't know, uh, then you can have really a bad year there, right? You can have really poor pregnancy rates uh, because we we fail to, to check those bulls and make sure that they were ready to breed when we need them to breed. So... Um, but we talked a lot about this this um, this assumption, right? That when we're using fixed time AI, we can cut our bull power in half, right? So can really can we really decrease the bull to cow ratio after time AI? And that's a question that we get quite often. And people usually are very nervous about doing this because if you've done estro synchronization, you know that those cows will come back, our open cows. Cows that don't become pregnant to AI uh, will come back pretty synchronized um, in Astros, right? So um, within 18 days after AI to 20 days after AI, a lot of cows will get back in heat. Um, our open cows will get back in heat and you see a lot of activity. So uh, most people are scared or afraid that if we don't have really a strong bull presence, we might miss some cows. We might fail to get cows pregnant on that estrus return after fixed time AI, right? So people are reluctant um, to uh, to cut that bull power in half, right? Because they're afraid again that uh, we're not going to have enough bull power to breed those cows as they come back in. So uh, we we did a study here at Virginia Tech. Uh, had a, a student. Uh, Claire Kimling, PhD student, that was really good at the numbers, and we have access to uh, to pretty uh, large data sets. So we we had an opportunity to do a retrospective analysis and look at bull to cow ratio and its effects on pregnancy rate uh, to cows that have been previously uh, exposed to fixed time AI, uh, fixed time AI protocols. Right. So for that study, uh, we use data from the Virginia Department of Corrections, who's the state prison. Here in Virginia, uh, through the department, uh, through the um, large animal clinical sciences at the vet school, we provide all animal health care and reproductive management for those herds. And we manage all the data uh, from those cattle. So uh, we have access to about 13 breeding seasons, fall and spring, from 2010 to 2017, a total of almost 15,000 breeding records that we had access to. And all those cows, um, Meeting locations are enrolled in time day AI protocols, and then they're exposed to uh, uh, natural service cleanup bulls for a 70 day breeding season. And uh, we expose cows to the bulls uh, 10 days after AI. So we consider the first day of the breeding season the day of AI, and then uh, a week to 10 days after that, we put the bulls with the cows 
and they'll stay in for um, another 60 days roughly for a total of 70 day breeding season. Um, through all those years, all bulls have passed the BSE and the age vary from two to four years, okay? Uh, the age of those bulls. Our mean bull to cow ratio throughout uh, those 13 breeding seasons was one bull to 31 cows. The minimum was one bull to nine cows and the max was one bull to 73 cows, right? But our average, uh, one bull to, to 31 cows, which is close to that recommendation that we mentioned earlier, that one to 25, one to 30. Um, you know, we, we looked at this, this data a couple of different ways. Um, here on this table, we can, we're looking at the total number of cows, right? So this is uh, considered cows uh, the total number of cows that were enrolled in the fixed time AI and then into the breeding season, right? So we have um, here are quartiles, so the, the kind of a lower bull to cow ratio and then increasing number of cows to bulls, right? As we go on on our, our columns here on quartiles, so have more cows per bull versus less cows per bull, okay? Um, so I went to 19 average, I went to 27, I went to 33, almost 34, and I one bull to 48 uh, and a half cows, okay? Um, pregnancy rate, as we mentioned earlier, uh, about 55%, right? So right around that, that 50% uh, pregnancy rate that we expect uh, across all those 13 breeding seasons and almost 15 breeding records. Um, and then... Um, here's what we're really looking at, right? So pregnancy rate on that first return to estrus, so pregnancy rate to uh, clean up bulls on that first return to estrus, really didn't differ um, between those different bull to cow ratios, okay? And um, pregnancy rate to the subsequent uh, estrus, right? Because uh, if you have a 70 day breeding season, uh, those cows will probably have close to three cycles, right? Uh, estrocycles. cycles, if you consider this a uh, 21 day estro cycle. So three chances to get pregnant by the bull and the bull to cow ratio really didn't affect uh, pregnancy rate on those, those cows as well. But, you know, one of the things that we wanted to look is what if we have a bad year of fixed time AI and we have less cows pregnant um, to, to fix time the eye, right? So then we will have more open cows for those cleanup bulls to breed. So we looked at open cow uh, versus uh, just total number of cows, right? So we look at bull to cow ratio on the, our open cow, uh, so cows that didn't become pregnant for fix time the eye, okay? So uh, if we look at just open cow, so our um, one to seven, uh, one bull to one to seven cows, one to 12, one to 16, and one to 25, uh, bull to cow ratio, okay? Look at our pregnancy rate to that first return of asterisk. Again, it did not differ uh, among those different bull to cow ratios and the subsequent asterisk as well, okay? So very similar there uh, to, to what we saw in the total number of cows. Um, Look at we do some uh, linear regressions and uh, we separate that between spring and, and fall because they, they do differ. Um, you know, our, in our prison data, our fall cows do better um, and reproductive um, than um, our spring cows. So we had to separate. There's an effect of season there, so we had to separate uh, our spring cows from our, our fall cows. Uh, but this is. Uh, linear regression here, so pregnancy rate by total cow exposed, right? So this is counting all the cows, uh, not significant, a very uh, low correlation there. Uh, and then when we all look at open cows only, uh, again, you know, very weak correlation and not significant, statistically significant correlation, right? That curve pretty much flat, which means that um, the bull to cow ratio really has very little effect on pregnancy rate uh, on that first estrus. Uh, on the fall breeding season, as we separate that on a total exposed cow, uh, you know, that line is a little bit more uh, uh, inclined there and is a, it is a significant, um, a statistically um, significant correlation there, right? But a very weak correlation, right? So it's about 0.04 
correlation between bull to cow ratio and pregnancy rate when we look in the fall. Uh, when we look at open cows only uh, for the fall, we had to separate that data a little bit more. So we have a couple groups that were single sire, natural service, uh, and a few groups that have multiple sires. So, you know, two bulls per group versus one bull to, per group. And uh, they really did, they differ a little bit. So when you're using a single sire uh, in a group, our correlation was the strongest correlation that we have, but it's still a weak correlation uh, when you consider, um, you know, a correlation there, but, um, you know, significant there for sure. It kind of makes sense, right? If you only have one bull uh, breeding, uh, breeding and the, the breeding group, uh, you know, we could expect that um, you may have uh, a, a correlation, but again, not a strong correlation between uh, the, the bull to cow ratio and pregnancy rate. So um, put that in a nutshell, when you look at all cows, our bull to cow ratio really only um, affect about one to 4% of the observed variation in pregnancy rate, okay? If you look at open cows, we, uh, the observed variation about, you know, increases a little bit, but still not, uh, not a great, um, effect of bull to cow ratio on pregnancy rate, which means that bull to cow ratio is really not the main factor affecting pregnancy rate on their return to estrus, right? So might be other things like cow body condition score, cow days postpartum, right? And, and other factors uh, rather than just the, the bull to cow ratio, right? Or even perhaps because we can't sort that out there, those bulls all pass a BSC, but the ability of the bull to breed, right, uh, might be playing a, a number here, okay, uh, as well. So, um, you know, based on our data, when you're combining fixed time AI and using natural service, um, you know, using cleanup bulls, you can do looking at total number of cows at one to 50, which brings that down to one to 25, right, when you're looking at a 50% pregnancy rate, for example, uh, to time the AI, uh, which goes back to that uh, initial recommendation uh, that the one to 25 bull to cow ratio. So if you do have 100 cows and you're using fixed time the AI, yes, you can buy two bulls uh, and, and, and sleep peacefully knowing that if your bulls have passed the BSC, right? Uh, and are ready to breed cows, uh, that they will breed the cows and we will not be a limiting factor uh, when uh, on that first return to estrus, okay? Now, really important too, uh, consider pasture size, right? So I know we talked to some of the, uh, some of the states out there in the Midwest, you have range cattle and, you know, those are different situations. And I, I do believe that um, that can be an effect, right? That's not something that we are looking here in this study. Uh, but you know, I think I think it's important to consider that uh, pasture size. I think definitely can limit the ability of the bull uh, to breed a large number of cows because he does need to to find those cows in the range. Um, and also, if you're using single sires, right? If you uh, have a small herd and are relying solely on one bull, you want to make sure they're watching that bull very closely, right? You want to make sure that he passed the BSC and you're watching him breed cows, uh, making sure that he is breeding cows, uh, and, you know, just again, watch him closely, right? Um, with that, uh, I want to thank you. This is my email. Uh, we're on X, uh, you know, former Twitter. Uh, you can follow us there. And um, again, if you have not yet, please connect with us on our social media on the Beef Reputation Task Force. And I will answer some questions. Uh, please remember, type your question on the Q&A and uh, we will uh, try and answer as many as we can. Dr. Pedro Fontes is joining me here. He's another member of Beef Reputation Task Force from Georgia, University of Georgia, and he'll be moderating the questions. So Pedro, thank you. Well, um, thank you, Vitor. Um, and good evening, everyone. Um, so 
if you are, we got a few questions here coming in in the Q&A. So if you have any questions, I see a few of you raise your hand during the presentation. If you would please um, actually type the questions in the Q&A, we're going to read those questions out uh, for Vitor to, to answer. So uh, Vitor, the, the first question is a little bit of a comment, a little bit of a question here. Uh, earlier when you were talking about bow costs, right? Mm -hmm. uh, one of the comments that were made here was regard to to how many years those bulls are going to stay in the herd. Mm -hmm. Some people use bulls for, you know, up to four years or more. So how does that influence your, your cost per pregnancy there in a, in a natural service setting? Yeah. I mean, for sure. Right. Um, it, 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 we, um, it seems like a big check when we buy the bull, right. Uh, for example, let's say we're buying a $6,000 bull. That's a, it seems like a, a big cost there, but yeah, I agree. You know, we're going to use that bull for four years. You got to dilute down that cost. And if you really look that way, it's not a large cost, right? It really isn't. Uh, but still, uh, you know, it is a a a cost that if we can reduce that by half uh, while using fixed time DI, right? That that the useful life of the bull is used on the economic model, right? So even though you use that bull more than a year, the the useful life of the bull is used on that economic model to, to predict whether or not fixed time the AI um, is beneficial economically for you, right? So if you're using that bull uh, for more than four years, which is, you know, most people don't do that, uh, that cost will even go go lower. But but again, yeah, uh, it is a, uh, a, a cost. And even though, it goes down as you dilute it down in years. Fixed time AI seems to still be uh, a very um, good option there economically. Great, thank you, Vitor. Um, next question that I have here is regards to, you know, you mentioned in your presentation when when we expose cows to one round of AI, right? How they because they're synchronized, they come out, they come back in heat. The open ones a little bit in a tight window. So, so um, how tight of a window is that? And and based on the data you presented there, um, you know, how much can we push from a from a bull to cow ratio standpoint? Yeah. Um, so the data that we have on on uh, return to estrus of those cows that being synchronized uh, is that uh, you're going to have about well, let me take about seventy five percent of the cows. Uh, that are open, we'll come back in Astros within about a three-day window, okay? Um, so a lot of times it's between that day 20, day 19, day 22, right? Uh, kind of varies a little bit. Uh, but once you start getting cows in Astros, uh, on the return to Astros, usually within the next three days, you're going to get most of them, right? So... Um, and, and again, that was the, the whole idea of our study to look at just open cow, right? And, and the bull to cow ratio, uh, which just open cow, is to look at that, right? If they're coming back synchronized, is that still a problem? And, and again, it, it doesn't seem to be. Uh, if the bull is in good condition, if the bull has passed a BSC, he can breed those cows over those three days. Uh, and he should be able to do that without a problem, without affecting pregnancy rate as well. Great, thank you. Um, so so the next one that I have here is uh, related to bull to cow ratio from a bull breed standpoint. Um, you mentioned uh, some of the general recommendations uh, mm -hmm. for, you know, when you're not using AI of one bull for every uh, yep. 30, 25 to 30 cows. Uh, is this just based on, you know, our predominantly Bostaros breeds? Like yeah, Andrew, those are, Andrew. should have mentioned that. Um, good question. Those are all uh, based on Bostaros. Um, you know, our Bosinicos animals have smaller scroll circumference a lot of times. So uh, that rule, that calculation, it is for Bostaros animals. Um, it is. But I think the age one especially, actually not sure about the formula on... Um, uh, on the uh, Bosinicus, but the age recommendation usually stands, right? If a bull is 20 months old, 
you should be breeding 20 cows and, and so on, kind of a limit there. Another one here is with regards to, to how early they do a breeding soundness exam is the question is, is the recommendation still uh, 60 days before the beginning of the breeding season? Yeah. So the recommendation is 60 days. And the reason it is 60 days um, is because spermatogenesis, right, as sperm is being formed at the testicle, uh, it takes about 60 days for the sperm that was formed today to be ejaculated, right? So it takes about a it's a sixty day journey um, that the sperm goes through. So, um, you know, we talk about that. So, in essence, if a bull fails today, uh, if you want to retest him, we usually give a, a sixty day window to retest, uh, so that we can get, you know, a full uh, period there to, for those bulls to to recover or you know to be retested. Um, so the, the 60 days before the breeding season comes from that, right? And it can be, um, I think it's more applicable if you want to retest the bull, right? Uh, for example, but if, if you are uh, going to sell those bulls and buy new bulls, then perhaps uh, not so applicable. But, you know, 60 days is a good time to uh, make sure that you can find a good bull. Uh, you can visit a couple places and go to a couple sales. So um, that's that's where the recommendation kind of comes from. Uh, it's based on that spermatogenesis cycle and so on to be able to retest those bulls and make sure um, they haven't recovered, for example, if you want to give them a chance to recover. Sure. Um, the, the next question that I have here, Vitor, um, is regards to the timing uh, after timed AI. So if I expose cows to a round of timed AI, how soon after that uh, can I or should I turn bulls in? Yeah, um, you know, it, there's really not a rule, right? Uh, it kind of depends on what you want to do. Uh, if you care of um, whether or not that calf is going to be AI or bull uh, natural service, you know, and you don't want to do a genetic test to see parentage, uh, you know, parentage, then if you give a week, 10 days, uh, between the time of AI and when you put the bulls, then you can really separate those pregnancies once we do the preg checks, right? Because um, never say never, but you know, it would be very rarely that you're going to have a cow that went through the synchronization uh, program that will be showing astros a week after um, AI, right? So again, we talk about the return to astros being somewhat synchronized. So most of our cows will start showing astros around the 18 to 21 days uh, after AI. So uh, if you wait a week, 10 days, and we, you know, we, uh, the prison here, we do 10 days, um, then we, when we're ultrasounding those cattle, we can very easily separate them. And I can say, yes, this is an AI pregnancy. You know, this is a bull pregnancy and so on. So that's, that's why we do that. But I mean, if you don't care about that, put the bull the first day, I don't know, I AI them and put the bull <laughs> the next day um, because if you have a cow that comes back in estrus, you can catch them. It kind of doesn't, it depends on what the goals of your operation are. And kind of like building on that. So in, any thoughts on, on kind of like what you're saying now on turning the cleanup bow in, you know, two to six hours, uh, after the time they eye? Um, you know, I, again, that we're probably going to have some cows, uh, you know, the general age injection that kind of kills a lot of the astros, right? When you, if you give, give a general age injection at the time of AI, um, you're kind of going to usually, it really uh, stops the astros activity pretty quickly. Um, so you, you might have a bull that will breed a few cows. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure if it's going to do a big difference or not. I'm not aware of Pedro. Are you aware? Yeah, you know, I've seen some studies not 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 published. I think in a thesis format. Um, I can't remember where it's from. Maybe from K State, Sandy. Uh, yeah. Um, Ashley Hartman, working with Dave Grieger and some others, they uh, DNA tested some calves, and it wasn't the entire group, but a subsample. 
and they had two different years they did this and so um turn bulls in essentially immediately after ai and <clears throat> in the heifer uh, in the heifers that were bred five to ten percent of those heifers were bred natural or from the natural service sire and the in the cows it was was 15 to 20 percent so uh, whether there's actually an age difference there you know there're not a lot of observations but that that gives you an idea there were about um uh, close to 300 animals represented in that but that's still not a, a large number for you know what we're looking at so you're, you're going to get some and it gets gets back to what your goals are. What What's the value of that? And if you need to clearly define that AI bred um, calf or not. Perfect. Perfect, thank you. Um, the next question, Victoria, is uh, in a situation of heat stress, uh, do you do you change the bull to cow ratio recommendation when you're working with producers? So, um, you know, Heat stress is a real thing, right? We we um up until quite recently we we'll just ignore that on the beef <laughs> the beef animal. Uh, we've ex studied that extensively on the dairy cattle. Uh, we know it affects the female, affects the male. Uh, it can impact spermatogenesis and you know and, and all those things. So so yeah, I mean uh, you know heat stress is going to affect the bulls, it's going to affect the cow. So. Uh, instead of changing the bull to cow ratio, hopefully you're changing your breeding season. <laughs> um, you know that would be my my recommendation. I mean, of course, there's there might be a um, you know a situation where we just kind of have a heat wave out of the blue and things like that. Um, in the same way with when temperatures get super cold, what kind of what we have right now. Um, and if we're in the middle of the breeding season, I'm sure you will affect. Um, your your animals and it might affect you know it will affect your reproductive um, performance but um, but yeah um, I, I think again hopefully you know when we were in Florida right we we're breeding March April uh, to be done in May before it gets too hot right um, because we know it's going to affect that uh, for sure so instead of trying to put more bulls out there so they can have more bulls stressed <laughs> and then uh, you know breeding more cows are heat stress. Maybe we, you know, need to rethink the the breeding season, uh, if if possible. Okay, in areas that are tropical, you know, I'm from Brazil, and we have areas that are hot and then hotter, right? So we try to do that in the hot areas, and we use animals that are adapted, um, and and, and can uh, do a good job uh, on those types of environment. Um, the other question that I have here, Vitor. Uh, is with regards to how many cows can uh, a bull service in a day, right? As we think about, you know, maybe those cows coming back from the AI, you know, we might have, like you said, they're going to show heat in a tight window. How many how many cows can a bull breed in a day? So they can breed a lot of cows, uh, actually. Um, you know, I'm, I'm going to lie here if I sell a number, um, but they can breed a lot of cows. Uh, and, you know, maybe... Pedro, Shelby, Joe, Sandy, you guys can help me here with a number. Um, but again, looking at our data, you know, they can breed as many cows as coming heat, it seems like, uh, without much of a problem, right? Without going beyond that 1 to 50, that 1 to 25, then with the open cows. Joe? Yeah, yeah, I think that's that's accurate, Vitor. And, th and there's a wide variety of data that shows that cows can excuse me, bulls can breed 50 cows in a day, um, some other bulls, 40 cows, et cetera. Uh, one of the things that we, we need to remember is that bulls will not reduce the number of sperm to such a level that pregnancies won't occur. We know that bulls don't become sperm depleted with successive ejaculations. Uh, so that's not an issue. The main issue is libido level. 
and their willingness is really what the main issue is. And then, of course, you don't want them to lose lots and lots of weight either. You don't want to overwork a bull and have a bull lose weight. But in general, they, they can breed many, many cows and they will not run out of sperm. They will still have millions of sperm in the ejaculate after 14, 15, 20 ejaculates. Yeah. Yeah, we're talking billions of sperm, right? And then uh, natural ejaculation. And then when we're doing AI, we're talking eight to 20 million, right? So, uh, you know, to, to, to get the job done there. So yeah, good comment, Joe, thank you. All right, Victor, we're, 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 we're getting to the end here. Um, <laughs> Um, so far, this is the last question. Um, why does uh, scrotal circumference affect uh, the amount of cows a bull can can breed? Yeah, that's um, you know, as I mentioned, um, that's directly related to the semen production capability, right? So, uh, as as Joe mentioned here, uh, you know, a, a larger scrotum usually correlated to more semen production. Uh, so, and also, right, especially if you think about the younger bulls, you think about an immature animal, right, that's still growing, that's still learning to breed and still learning uh, uh, his way around the cows and all those things. So um, the, the, the effect comes from that, uh, comes from that animal being able to produce more sperm and also related to whether or not that animal uh, has reached full maturity, right? All right, Victor, I think uh, that answers um, all our questions here. Uh, there's some questions that are repeated here in the Q&A. Yeah. So, so yeah, thank you. And I'll, I'll turn it over to you again. Yeah. Um, no, I just want to, again, thank everybody. I think we're uh, like 90 some people, you know, we're always um, happy to see people join us. Uh, sometimes it's late at night for some people, you know, it's nine o'clock for me here. Uh, so we really appreciate you guys. Uh, I want to remember that this was recorded. We're going to be posting on our YouTube channel. So um, if you think of somebody that needs to watch this, uh, send them a, a, an alert and we'll be posting, you know, uh, on our social media, whenever that video is posted on YouTube, we'll be, uh, you know, making that public, telling everybody. Again, uh, this webinar series happens every third Tuesday of the month from January uh, to, to May, June. And uh, last thing, you know, hopefully you can uh, join us in Athens, Georgia for the ARSBC meeting on September 4 and 5. Uh, thank you very much. We'll see you guys next month. <laughs>